Good morning. Everybody uh, toupees stayed on this morning. The wind has been crazy. I don't know about your house, but mine vibrated all night, uh, which was not fun, but it's still standing, so that's good. Um, welcome as we gather for worship this morning, those of you here in person and those of you uh, joining us online, we welcome you uh, as we gather for worship this morning, uh, the God of creation, uh, the God who's given us full life. And for those of you who are not here, every head just turned in the room uh, because Natalie, Marcel, and uh, uh, Sophie just walked in. So welcome, you guys. As we turn to worship this morning, I'm going to read from uh, Romans chapter 5 in the call to worship, and the team will lead, then lead us in worship through song. Romans chapter 5, the first eight verses. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance character and character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone may possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As you see fit, feel free to stand or sit as we worship the Lord of creation this morning through song. Let us sing. Stand with us.
Remembrance Day, and so at this time in our service, I've invited uh, Naomi and Hudson uh, to lead us through the act of remembrance. Uh, as well on the screen, George came in yesterday and we recorded him playing trumpet. He will lead us through the last post, moment of silence, and then reveille. So Hudson and Ke uh, Naomi, thank you for leading us this morning. In Flounder's Field, in Flounder's Field, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row, that mark our place when in the sky, the lark so bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. For days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we live in Flounders, and now we lie in Flounders fields. Take up our quarrel with the fo foe, to you the failing hands we throw, the torch be yours and hold it high. If ye break faith with us, you die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flounder's field. I um, now have the uh, privilege to lead us in the remembering of our veterans. On all the oceans, 
the white caps flow. There are no crosses, row on row. For those who lie beneath the sea, rest in peace. Our land is free. We will remember them. You shared with him the eagle's view, the right to fly as eagles do, the right to call the clouds your home, and grateful through your heaven's rain. We will remember them. They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn them. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Good morning, or well, welcome on this cold or cool uh, winter's morning. Um, I have the privilege of doing prayer this morning, so please join me in prayer. I'm going to start off with Hebrews uh, chapter 4 from verse 14 to 16. Seeing that then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confessions. For when we do have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help him in the time of need. Close our eyes. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity this morning as, uh, as your body to gather and come together and be able to worship you and to give you all the glory. We read in Hebrews 4 that we can come to your throne boldly and receive grace and mercy. We come and ask that you would pour out your spirit with your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your son that made the ultimate sacrifice. Today we remember those who made sacrifices for for their land. We come and remember as well, Father, that your son made the ultimate sacrifice so that we can be saved, that we can have everlasting life, that we can be made righteous and be adopted as sons and daughters in your kingdom, that we can experience your kingdom here on earth. What a privilege this is to be know that we can live in your freedom on this earth, that we can experience you on this earth. It's not only for one day, Father, that we have hope, but we have hope here on earth. We have hope to, when we see your nature. We have hope when we see someone helping someone else, when your love flows. As we sang earlier this morning, Psalm 23, where it talks about we will not have any need, uh, Father, when we are even in the valley of the shadow of death, that we will not have no lack just talks about your grace and your mercy that you've poured out when we come to your throne, that you've given us enough. Even 2 Corinthians tells us that your grace is sufficient in our weakness. It's made perfect in, your, in our weakness. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the privilege that we can come to you and be in remembrance that we are on mission for you. That you've called us to be your hands and feet here on earth, that we can serve those who are in need, that we can come and pray for those who are in need, those in need of healing, those in need of jobs, Father, those in need of just love. May we be guided through your spirit, through the eyes of Jesus, that we can come and see those and be your hands and feet as you called us to be. Father, may the words being spoken today, may that abide in us for this week. May we truly be your hands and feet for this week that is to come. May we see the need May we see the need of love and to know that we can always approach you boldly and that you have mercy for us and grace. Thank you, Father, for this aspect. Thank you that we can come and ask all these things in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, so I'll be reading from 1 Kings 19, 9 to 18. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he, pull he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one net left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nishim, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, to, success, to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazel, and Elisha, El Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve, reserve 7,000 in Israel who all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him.
morning once again. Uh, thank you, Ethan, for reading that, Virus for leading us in prayer, and uh, the Goodwins um, and George for leading us in our act of remembrance. Um, we continue on our Old Testament uh, stories, Old Testament, or walk through the Old Testament, and we've come to our second prophet. Uh, we did a prophet a few weeks ago. Can anyone remember who that prophet was? Samuel. So Samuel is kind of the first prophet that shows up, um, apart from Moses, and Samuel's the one who anoints King David. And he, he's got a difficult job, and he, he grows up uh, under, um, uh, in the temple, and he actually, we, we talked about then that he was doing the works of God, but he didn't yet know God. And then God appears to him and speaks to him and uh, begins his ministry. Elijah is a whole different prophet. And as you heard in what uh, Ethan just spoke or read for us a few moments ago, uh, he's at a really low point in his life here. Elijah, or Elijah feels utterly beaten up. He feels like he is all alone, that he has been zealous, that he's done what he's been called to do, but, and yet his life is still on the line. The queen wants to have him murdered. If we flip back a, a couple chapters, verses 17 and 18, we see a different Elijah. We see Elijah who's confident, who speaks boldly, who proclaims God's word, who actually taunts uh, the prophets of Baal and says, you know, do whatever you need to do to make uh, your God rain fire down and light these sacrifices on fire. He mocks them and ridicules them. But in this moment, Elijah has, has torn off. Uh, he's left Israel. He's left Judah. He's headed south, and he's headed to Horeb. And if you don't recognize Horeb, you may recognize it called Sinai. He's gone to the place where Moses originally got the law. The prophet Elijah is the prophet who's been fulfilling the law, who's been maintaining the law, who's been proclaiming people to follow the law. He retreats in utter despair to the place where the law was originally given. And so here in the period of Israel, we have a divided country. We have an evil king and an evil queen who are serving false gods. And this man Elijah, who's called to proclaim God, feeling at his lowest. Just a quick note about prophets. We often, when we hear the word, we often think prophets are the ones who are to, supposed to tell, tell the future, talk about what's upcoming. And there is that aspect to it, and you get through it, the scriptures. Um, the reason you know someone is a prophet is because what they've said has come true. But the role, the main role of the prophet was to be God's voice. Something was going on, God needs, wants to communicate with his people, and he uses a prophet to communicate what it is that's going on. And so that's why Moses is called a prophet, because God uses him specifically to communicate his law to the people. That's why Samson is a prophet, or a, not Samson, Samuel is a prophet, because he's used by God to anoint the king and to communicate his law to the people. Elijah here has been proclaiming the kingdom. He's been proclaiming Yahweh, the one true God, and his voice, he feels now at this point, his voice has become useless. Despite the fact that all the Baal prophets, all the Asherah prophets have been put to death, the queen has no interest in what he has to say. And she says, if what happened to my prophets doesn't happen to you, may I be punished. And she sends someone off to find Elijah, and he runs away. The first point in this morning's sermon is actually a, a line that one of my professors back in seminary gave to me. And that professor actually just died this week, Dan Morgan. Uh, he was down, he just retired last year, December last year, moved back to Oklahoma, he and his wife Melanie, uh, where their kids and grandkids were, uh, he succumbed to COVID uh, on Wednesday. And he said this, he was our missiology professor, uh, he was our church planning professor, and he repeated this line often. And he repeated it, if, if you had ever had a chance to meet him, he had this sparkle in his eye and he said this. And this is what we see going on here in this passage. People do what makes sense to them, even crazy people. He would say time and time again, remember, as you lead people, as you pastor, as you church plant, as you proclaim the word of God, remember that people do what makes sense to them, even crazy people. And that what he was trying to communicate to us and what we need to hear in this passage is that the actions of the people that are going on are neither, I mean, we could rate them evil or, or holy. We could rate them good or bad. But in their eyes, it's exactly what makes sense to them. For Jezebel, this evil queen, the fact that all her prophets were wiped out, 
despite that God, the Yahweh, the God of creation, showed up and demonstrated his power and made himself known, it didn't matter to her. What mattered is that her power was threatened. And so what made sense to her was not to go, hey, and maybe I should listen to what Elijah has to say. What made sense to her was to say, we've got to get rid of that guy. He's causing me trouble. He's threatening my kingdom. He's disturbing the people. Elijah, for him, it made sense why he ran away. If you had been called to proclaim God and you had seen God succeed, and despite God's presence being made known wholeheartedly, despite all these prophets, uh, false prophets being destroyed, to have the, the queen of the kingdom that is supposed to be the kingdom of God's people still say, you know what, I'm going to take you out, you're bothering me, it makes sense that he would be in utter depression right now. That he would just feel like, I, I don't know what else to do. I don't know how else to demonstrate and proclaim what God has done and what he is doing. It would make sense that he would run away. For the people in the Mount Carmel episode where, where the fire rains down and the, and the um, uh, sacrifices are burnt, they, the question before them wasn't uh, who is the better God. The question, the purpose of the story wasn't um, to, to just simply demonstrate that God's a good God. The purpose of that experience was to demonstrate that God is God. The people had lost their way. The people were now worshiping Baal. They were worshiping Asherah. And the whole point of that Mount Carmel experience, the fire coming down to, from heaven, was to demonstrate that God is God. And it turns their hearts back to him. They realize that God is who he says he is and that Elijah is his prophet. But what's really going on in the people's hearts throughout our experience, what really goes on in your and my hearts, is our tendency is for self-preservation. And that makes sense. If we're going to be crushed by something or if it seems profitable to go a certain way, we tend to go that way. And that's what the people of Israel were doing. The, the queen was proclaiming Baal. Uh, you were safe if you worshipped that God and not Yahweh. And so it made sense that their hearts were turned towards Baal and not Yahweh. People do what makes sense to them, even crazy people. When we recognize that in our own lives, and when we recognize that in the life of others, we can start to understand that people aren't just making decisions because they want to be crazy or they want to be different than us. They're making, you and I make decisions because it makes sense to us. And so the question then before us is, how do we know or when do we go against what makes sense to us to pursue what it is that God is calling us to do? How do we know when we need to go against what makes sense to us because there's actually a better way? That's the role that Elijah was stepping into. That's the role of the prophet. That's the role of you and I who understand Jesus Christ is to recognize that the, the natural inclination of our hearts is not towards him, it's towards ourselves. And so that is why we need to understand who God is, to read his word, to come before him, to lay down our life, that we would get rid of what makes sense to us and do and follow what makes sense to God. And so we see here Elijah at his lowest point. The kingdom of Israel is divided and warring with itself. All hope is gone. And Israel, or I mean Elijah heads out of Israel down to the mountain. On his own, he leaves his, he leaves his aid at the border and keeps traveling south. God provides him meals. Uh, they, he's fed, he's, he's nourished, that he can make this 40-day journey uh, down to Sinai or Horeb, as they say in 1 Kings. But is that the place for a prophet? Is the voice of God supposed to be in the middle of nowhere, all alone? Is the voice of God supposed to be focused only on, his, on what it is that he is up to? And the answer, obviously, is no. And we see that as God shows up to Elijah at the mountain and says to him, what are you doing here? Why are you here, Elijah? You've been anointed, you've seen me work, you know what's going on. Why are you here? What brought you to this place? And we hear in Elijah's response, I'm the only one left. I'm all alone. I'm by myself. 
There's no hope. And God calls Elijah to pay attention. He says, look, I'm going to pass by. Pay attention to what's going on. And as he's sitting there on Mount Horeb, he's in a cave, he comes out and there's an earthquake. There's a wind. There's a fire. All these ways, these aren't just loud and obnoxious things. These aren't just natural occurrences. These are ways that God has act, acted before. On Mount Carmel, Elijah saw it firsthand when fire came down from the sky, when God's fire came down and lit the sacrifices and burnt them fully. We see when uh, Joshua and Caleb and the guys come back from exploring the promised land uh, earlier on in Israel's history, and there's 12 of them, 10 of them say, it's too dangerous, let's not go. In the end, God opens up the earth, an earthquake, and swallows these men alive. God works in the wind, he works in the earthquake, he works in the fire. These aren't just random occurrences or natural phenomenon. These are ways that God has acted in the past, and Elijah realizes that's not how God is acting now. Right now, in the midst of my despair, in this season of history, Elijah realizes God is actually acting in a whisper. He's coming in gently. He's coming in quietly. God's grace is moving because despite calling Elijah out for running away and saying, what are you doing here? He says, look it, I still have work for you to do. You're still my voice and my prophet. I still want you to go back to where you've come from. Go back into that dangerous territory. Go back to the place where Jezebel wants to kill you. You need to do some anointing work. You need to proclaim my words some more. And we see Elijah, he gets back up, and he heads back. The grace of God, or the the point in this, the story we need to hear, the thing we need to know is that where we are does not determine who we are. Elijah had run away. He got scared. He got depressed. He felt beaten up, taken advantage of, useless. What's the point? But that wasn't who he was. God comes to him in the midst of his despair and says, what are you doing here? This isn't why I've selected you. This isn't why I've created you. Where you are right now is is not where I need you to be. Where I need you to be is back up in Israel, being my voice, anointing, carrying out my work. And so when we find ourselves, we know, I, I don't know about you, but for me, I've been in those moments where I just feel, what is the point? What value do I really have? What do I bring to the table? I've done all this And yet, I still feel somehow useless or without any power. In those moments, it seems, and this, at least for Elijah, God speaks to him not with power, but with a gentle whisper. He says, Elijah, I need you to go back. I need you to fulfill the task, fulfill the role, to be the person I've created you to be. Because despite you running away from me, that's not who you are. Who you are is my anointed. Who you are is my chosen. And as I read at the beginning of the service in Romans chapter 5, as Vyers read in Hebrews, who we are is people created in God's image, resurrected and saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so wherever you find yourself in life today, young, old, rich, poor, educated or not, strong or weak, God comes to us and he says, I've created you for so much more than this place you may be running away to. I've anointed you by the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. I've redeemed you and called you to engage in the work that I've been doing since the time of Elijah, since the time of Abraham, since the time of Adam and Eve. To be fruitful and multiply. To proclaim the kingdom of God. To let everyone know that Jesus is king. But here's one key point in this this season or in this moment that Elijah has on the mountain. The mountain that where God passed before Moses, he now passes before Elijah in a whisper. And the thing that we see in Elijah is that he knew God's voice. He knew he wasn't in the hurricane this time. He knew he wasn't in the earthquake this time. He knew he wasn't in the fire this time. He was a small whisper. And so each of us need to know 
God's voice. And we do that by reading his word, by coming before him in prayer, by engaging in fellowship and conversation together, by encouraging and challenging one another to pursue Jesus with everything we have. Because no matter where we are, it doesn't determine who we are. But when we hear the voice of God, he says to us, you are my beloved. You are worth my life that I laid down. I've called you on mission. And that brings us to the final piece, the last sentence in this passage, which is a reminder that no matter what, God is king. And so God picks Elijah up, maybe not physically, but metaphorically in his words and his language and says, I need you to go back. I need you to anoint these people. They're going to deal with those who've gone astray. But listen, you're not alone. You're not the only one who has been zealous for me. You're not the only one who knows my voice. You're not the only one. Elijah, there's 7,000 others. I know it's only a small amount in this large kingdom, but there's 7,000 others who have not bowed their knee to Baal, who have not worshipped someone other than me. I've protected them, Elijah. I've kept them. And so keep going. Go back to where you've come from. Engage in the work in which I've created you and called you to do. Because recognize, we need to recognize, Elijah needs to recognize, it's not up to us. It's up to God. Because no matter what, it's him that is king, and we are his people. He invites us to participate in the work of his kingdom. He calls each one of us to follow Jesus with everything we have to put our trust in him that we might become all he's created us to be. And so where the passage begins in the beginning of chapter 19, Elijah says, take my life, it's not worth anything. We find at the end of this section in verse 18, God says, don't worry, I've got things under control. I'm not going to take your life, I'm going to call you to full life, to be my prophet again, to anoint and to proclaim my kingdom. And don't worry, I've got a remnant that I've protected I've got a group. You're not alone. And that's who you and I are as the church. That's why it's important that you and I gather together. That's why it's important that we not only worship together, but we do life together, that we encourage one another, that we challenge one another, that we push one another on in pursuit of loving God with everything we have and our neighbor as ourself. Because there are moments in life when it feels like we are all alone. But God promises us that we are not. That he's, despite what's going on in politics, despite what's going on uh, in in our street corners, despite what is going on uh, around the world, he is at work. There is a remnant that is surviving. There are those that he is calling us to be a part of because it's not up to us. It's up to him. And so we must change our minds from doing what makes sense to us to doing what makes sense to God. Because when we do what makes sense to us, if I was to to change Dr. Morgan's phrase, I would say when we do what makes sense to us, we are crazy people. Because the only way to do things, the only way to pursue life, is to pursue it as Jesus did, in full submission to the Father, in full obedience to his will, in a full giving of our lives to him, that we might proclaim the kingdom of God, that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus, that we might love God with everything we have and our neighbor as ourself. And so where you go from here, the next decisions that you make, my hope and my prayer for you and for me is that we would make decisions to follow Christ with everything we have because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no matter what's going on right now, he is king. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can know your voice as we read the scriptures and as we attune our ear to the things you'd have us hear. We pray, Lord God, that we would hear the whisper of your voice, that we would see the power of your fire and earthquake and wind, and that we would know when it is you're speaking and in what way that you are communicating with us. We pray, Lord, that we would stop to do things that make sense to us and that we would do things that fully make sense to you every moment 
of every day. I thank you, Lord, that we are not alone, that you go with us and that you place a remnant, a community, a church, a body around us, that you place us into this body to have purpose and meaning, to fulfill our calling, to be your hands and your feet, your heart and your ears. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to unite us together and call us back and remind us of our mission that wherever we are, wherever we go, we would make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that your kingdom would be made known on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Would you stand with us as you are able and join us in honoring God with our closing song? We hope it will warm you for the drive home. team for leading us in music today. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we head out. Um, uh, here's the strongest announcement, okay? Everyone in here online, you don't need to worry about this. Uh, it is cold outside, and so you are welcome to interact in here. However, we have to maintain physical distance. So uh, I don't want to be the police officer, okay? So let's be respectful of each other's spaces, maintain distance as we interact, um, and, and once you're ready, uh, head out. Uh, but it's really important that we do that for our own safety and just to continue to abide by the rules that uh, AHS has laid out for us. All right, so that's the, that's the whatever. That one is important, but let's move on. 
Um, November 29th is our AGM. We're going to do that in the sanctuary and via Zoom. And so we'll get the details out for that. And that's for you know, budget and officers for this year. Um, and the information will all be up next week um, and available to everybody so we can um, talk about it, discuss it, and look forward to what's going to happen in 2021. And so let's continue to pray for our church as we uh, head forward in the mission that God has called us uh, into. That is all I've got for announcements today. And Angie's in here to tell me uh, because she's at, what I've forgotten because she's at home with uh, Noelle, whose surgery went really well um, this week. And I also got an email or a note from uh, Julia, uh, Leona's sister. She had a surgery for a gallbladder a couple of weeks ago, and that went well, and she, everything has gone well there. Um, and so that is really encouraging. Uh, and so let's conclude with benediction. Lord God, we have gathered as your people, called by your name, made whole by the blood of your Son. And as we go out from here, Lord, may we go with your blessing. May we go to proclaim that the kingdom has come. May we go to learn and hear and see you at work in the places around us and join in the work that you're a part of, that we might invite others to follow Jesus with all, with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so I pray a blessing upon this people, Lord, for we are yours, you are ours. May we go with your blessing to the corners of the world. Amen. Go in peace.